Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, hey everyone. So, good morning. So, today, I, Jin, and Leon, so are very happy to take the opportunity uh, to introduce our journey on how we decrease the HDFS unit storage cost like uh, in the past of several years. So, we are part of the data infra team in the data org of Uber. Yeah, so the next slide. Yeah, first, uh, <clears throat> first I'm gonna talk about uh, our HDFS skill in Uber. So you can see, right? So in, in our HDFS cluster, so daily we service about like 10 billion requests per day. And also we manage about like an X byte like level data, including like tens of clusters. And, uh, and in total, we have about uh, more than 11,000 hosts. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so we we'll have all kinds of, you can see, right? We have all kinds of data and like many others. So we use Kafka to ingest data into our data lake, right? So in our, as you can see, we store the, all the data in different tiers. So we have like a hot, hot, uh, hot data. So the hot tier data for us is normally less than three months, then warm data and also the <clears throat> archival and the cold data. So for us, the cold data is very minimal. So the reason is like uh, the cold data for us example is like uh, we don't have main access to those data. So for us, the, the volume of the data is very minimal because the reason is like we can just delete them unless there's some like special use case, we have to keep them around for a certain time. So that's about our like, uh, like kind of the use case for the HDFS cluster. What? Yeah. So this is the second one. This is the the, the next slide. So this slide we where where show talk about uh, like the HDFS cluster deployment in our Uber. So you can see, right, we leverage the HDFS routers. So basically, HDFS federation to do the horizontal scale. So another good thing is like, because we have this uh, routing layer, so our data movement is uh, hidden from the users. So you can, uh, you can see, right, we can move the data from hot tier to warm tier, like transparent to the user. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing is like, you also can see, right, we have four types of clusters. So like a warm prime ingestion cluster and, and the ETL clusters. The reason why we have so many like, different types of cluster, because so that time we want to scale our name node traffic. So we want like a split like a write traffic, read traffic, and also something like in between. Yeah. So yeah, so the other thing is like, we also provide like isolation. So that's why we create a, like a different type of clusters. But in the future, eventually we want to build our homogeneous like a cluster. And so later we can like distribute our traffic like among those clusters. So in this slide, uh, so I want to show, so how we, how our TCO unit storage cost deduction, like a 10X deduction since 2018. So we intentionally hide the, the actual numbers for the IP purpose, but you can see the skill. So in the 2018, so our like a, like a per, uh, per TB TCO, uh, TCO unit storage cost is more than $500 per TB. And along the way, we dec like today, we decrease our like uh, storage cost less than like $50 per TB. And then this is less than 50% of the standard storage cost from like a major like a cloud providers. So you can think about the S3 and the GCS. So in the, in the slides, we, so we, uh, we, we, play, uh, we put some 5G, 5K, 5W. So those are just our internal skill name, like hardware name. <clears throat> so in this slide, I so we contributed in this slide, I we contributed like three major reasons, like factors. So how we can like decrease our unit storage cost. The first fact is like we use a higher density storage node. So you can see in, in the 2018, right? So our storage node is about like we have 24 disks, and each disk have about like a 2 TB, like a disk size. And in 2019, we introduced the data theory. So basically we, we build like a warm cluster and the hot cluster. So for the hot cluster, we have 24 disks and also each disk is about 4 TB. But for the warm cluster, 
So we already have increased our number of disks to 35 and the disk size to 8 TB. So today we, we, we converge all these like a hot skill and a warm skill. So right now we have a unified skill. <clears throat> so, the, so this skill, we have 35 disk and also the disk size is 16 TB. So although you can look in the slides, it's very simple, right? We can just throw in higher density like story in order to decrease our unit storage cost. But in reality, actually this is hard as you know, right? Once the disk, although the disk density is keep increasing, like exponentially increasing, but the disk I/O, like a, like a per disk IOPS didn't increase much. So it's more like a 30, 30 to 50% increase. Yeah. So we, uh, I think that's more asking is, uh, is uh, are we using the hard drive or SSD? So far as all like a hard disk, spindle disks. So like today, we already have like separate cluster, like warm cluster and uh, and uh, and hot cluster. But in the future, with this like a new effort in the data theory, we want to mix the hot and warm data within a single cluster. So in in order to build some like homogeneous clusters in the future. So the last thing we are using is the HDFS erasure encoding. So as we know, right, HDFS uh, like erasure encoding only available in 3.x. But our majority, like most of our clients, actually all our HDFS client and also Lexi client is in the in the in the HDFS 2.8. You know, right, from HDFS 2.8 to 3.x is incompatible upgrade. So it's also quite a, it's similarly quite a challenging for us how we can enable turn on erasure encoding in our like Uber setup. <clears throat> I think in the in the next slide, I think the Jim will talk about how we can enable those things, like overcome these challenges to turn on erasure encoding. In, inside of Uber. Okay, so in the in the next slide, I think I will pass the talk to Leon, and Leon will go some go with the details on about the, like one one of our effort in the in the new effort in the data theory in front. So Leon, so probably you can yeah. take over. Yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, so um um, so I'll talk about this effort that uh, how we managed the uh, disk I/O across the cluster. So. Um, so initially, we think uh, we have some observation on our current uh, um, uh, previous uh, uh, situation that uh, our P99 average DCTI, I, this IO utilization is not uh, actually uh, high. So which means that the IOPS of the uh, uh, lower density disks are not actually fully utilized. So this actually uh, give us the opportunity that uh, we can uh, actually use the uh, better and the denser disk that's available on the market every year uh, to actually, uh, in that case, we can actually tap in the uh, uh, use the disk, disk IOPS of the uh, lower density um, uh, disks inside the cluster. So we can make the cluster more cost efficient. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so I think Jeffrey also mentioned about that. So uh, if you if you look at the uh, um, uh, some measure, but maybe you can come up with, with the uh, uh, Q and A later. Uh, so so for the uh, HD technology, uh, um, the trend of the te HD technology is like uh, the a uh, single disk capacity actually increased a lot uh, in the uh, past few years. So for example, in uh, 2017, we uh, we mostly see like two, three terabyte per disk, and uh, in twenty eighteen uh, it uh, goes to four, four, four terabyte, and uh, uh, in twenty nineteen we have an eight terabyte disk, and now we we already have uh, like sixteen terabyte disk uh, from our vendors that we can use. Um, uh, so the this uh, this uh, uh, this capacity actually increased a lot. Uh, however, the IOPS uh, is didn't increase that much. Um, so if we uh, see it's almost a, a, a linear increase in uh, comparing to the uh, disk capacity. So uh, um, so in that case, we actually have the challenge that uh, uh, if we keep adopting the uh, cheaper uh, hardware on the market, so we will have the uh, challenge that we uh, the um, the disk IOPS of the entire cluster will not be balanced. So um, if the user hits the data node on a, like a very dense disk, uh, they will have performance issue. Uh, in the meantime, the uh, lower density disk will not be fully utilized. And uh, we have uh, so many different uh, kind of uh, uh, hardwares in the cluster over the years. Uh, next slide, please. 
Oh, uh, so the um, so uh, uh, this is uh, how we come up with this idea that uh, we can uh, probably do the data tiering on the uh, on the same disk or uh, uh, on different uh, kind of hardwares. So uh, previously, HFS already have a very good support on the uh, data tiering that uh, you can mark a disk uh, as a, a normal disk or mark it as an archive or some other kind of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, disks. Uh, however, the challenge is that uh, um, uh, with that, uh, you can, if we are doing the data theory, you can only mark one disk, entire disks as a, a hot and a, a, another entire disks as a, a, a code, uh, which means that when we have uh, this uh, multiple skills inside the cluster, it's, it will be very hard to uh, manage. And also, uh, if we just simply do the data theory, uh, the uh, archive data will not be, uh, uh, will, uh, will not be accessed that much. So we are basically wasting the uh, disk I/O of the uh, high density uh, disks, which is not, uh, still uh, some resource that we can um, uh, utilize. So, uh, so we come up with this idea that we can probably split one disk into two portions. So uh, one portion we make it as a hot, and uh, another portion we make it as a uh, uh, archive level, which uh, which holds the warm and the cold uh, blocks. Uh, so in uh, with that idea, we basically uh, par doing the partition on the HDFS uh, data node level, uh, uh, so we can fully utilize both the IOPS and the capacity of uh, each disk uh, by adjusting this ratio, and uh, uh, that will be just simply just adjusting the uh, um, uh, data node configuration. Uh, and next slide, please. And uh, this is uh, some some uh, um, some uh, some data that we got from our current cluster. So you can see that the the, uh, the green line is the uh, sixteen terabyte disk, and the, the yellow line is the four terabyte disk. So while the used capacity of the uh, sixteen terabyte disk is four uh, uh, x, the real traffic we can control it uh, almost uh, uh, on the one point five x. And uh, because the IOPS of the new disk is still a little bit higher per disk, so we uh, we see that our utilization is almost uh, the same uh, with these two type of uh, uh, skills inside our uh, inside the same cluster. Um, yeah. So with that, uh, I will pass down to Jing to talk about the EC effort. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Liang. Yeah. So uh, I guess most of us are already familiar with the original coding. So, but I will still do a quick review here. So we know originally uh, before 2016 uh, for Apache HDFS, we only support the replication. So we have uh, uh, by default three replicas for each uh, data block. So that give us uh, 3x the storage cost that provide us very good data reliability and uh, fast recovery. So since uh, 2016, uh, the community uh, put a lot of effort to develop the original coding and integrate that into the H, uh, HDFS. So for erasure coding, the general idea is uh, instead of the copy, replicate the original data into multiple replicas, so we do the encoding to calculate some parity blocks as the redundancy to achieve the extra, uh, to, to retrieve similar level of the data uh, durability uh, compared with the replication. So. Uh, the, for example, for the default uh, original coding policy in HDFS, so uh, we usually collect uh, six data blocks as the original data. And on top of that, we do extra calculation to uh, get another three parity blocks as the redundancy. Then for all these nine blocks, uh, we actually call them a single block group. Among this, uh, within this group, if we lose any of the three blocks, we still can run the uh, code algorithm to calculate the data back. So in general, uh, compared with the replication, the original coding uh, storage scheme can provide a similar data reliability, and but much um, lower this kind of storage overhead. So we can see the original data is uh, distributed among six data blocks, and we calculate extra three parity blocks. So the extra um, the the overall storage cost is a uh, uh, one point. Uh, 5x compared with a uh, 3x if adopting the uh, replication storage scheme. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, for HDFS, you really coding, uh, besides of the this kind of uh, encoding, the decoding part, 
we also use the striping um, uh, storage scheme, which means uh, we can support this kind of HDFS uh, writing uh, erasure coding data on the fly. So the first megabytes of the data we call it one cell will be written to the first data block. Then the second megabytes, the second cell will be written to the second data block and so on. So then after finishing the first stripe, that is six megabytes by default, then we come to the second stripe and so on. So in this way, actually, we don't need to collect the original six uh, complete data blocks to do the encoding calculation. We actually can just uh, write even a small uh, part of the data, then still we can we are able to do the calculation and uh, compute the parity blocks. So uh, HDFS reader coding, uh, the development work, the main development work have already been done uh, since uh, 2016. And after that, the original coding uh, feature is only supported by Apache Hadoop 3.x. Currently, uh, uh, the recommended uh, uh, release from Apache Hadoop uh, for erasure coding support is the release about 3.2.2. So uh, since 2016, actually, a lot of companies uh, started adopting uh, HDFS erasure coding and contributed a lot of extra uh, good features and bug fixes into the open source version. So currently, uh, I think uh, user coding has already been widely adopted. Uh, yeah, so to use HDFS user coding, actually, it's very simple. We can directly enable the user coding policies, set up the policies on top of the directories. Then all the newly uh, written data into that directory will be uh, used, uh, will uh, be written using the user coding storage policy uh, scheme. But here, the uh, all the data before we set up the user coding policy within that directory, we are still uh, using the replication uh, scheme. So, which means like we still need to do some offline conversion for those old data. Yeah, next slide, please. So, uh, to adopt the user coding in Uber, so our target is uh, just uh, make the whole transition um, as transparent as possible, so that we don't need the extra, those kind of uh, upgrades from the customer side. So this is the overview architecture for HDFS clusters in terms of the uh, data tiering. So we actually set up a separate uh, warm clusters to move and uh, periodically remove data with the uh, with certain this kind of age and uh, certain access pattern uh, from the hot tier to the warm tier. So we actually do physical move. We copy the data from the original place into the separate warm clusters. In the meanwhile, these warm, uh, these clusters, warm clusters also hold uh, extra copy for very important those kind of tables as the backup. And uh, also, we actually move some of the data to the archival storage on cloud to save the cost. Uh, next slide, please. So after adopting erasure coding, here actually the overall uh, architecture actually still uh, stay the same. So here the main change is, um, so most of our existing HDFS and Hadoop architecture is uh, still using Hadoop 2.x. And uh, uh, EC erasure coding is only supported by 3.x. So which means we need to upgrade at least the warm clusters uh, to support erasure coding. And in the meanwhile, uh, maybe the easiest way to support this kind of data copy into EC requirement is also have separate young cluster running to 3.x. These young clusters will be uh, with small size and uh, dedicated only to uh, use the, by the DCP jobs to copy the data from the original hot cluster to the warm clusters. And in the meanwhile, so we actually have the uh, HDFS routers just between the clients and the HDFS servers so that uh, the order movement within HDFS clusters will totally be transparent to end users. In next slide, please. So as we mentioned, the target here is still, we don't want to require all the customers to upgrade their Hadoop version. We all know that uh, there are a lot of incompatibilities between Hadoop 2.x and 3.x, especially in Yang, we have API and the configuration compatibilities. So if we require everybody to upgrade to 3.x immediately, 
so that will create a lot of ex, uh, extra workloads and maybe even chaos in the cluster. So here the strategy is uh, we will just uh, uh, work on an extra proxy layer uh, on top of the warm cluster to serve the EC data to the uh, Hadoop clients with older version. So the idea actually is very, very similar with the existing web HDFS inside HDFS. We all know for web HDFS, usually we, uh, we actually have a, uh, where you uh, actually launch a separate DFS client inside of the data node to serve the real read and the write requests coming from the web clients. So this DFS client is actually running the same version as the local data node. So in our case, which means we actually have this kind of uh, capability to launch a DFS client running Hadoop 3 inside of a Hadoop 3 data node and serving the web edge DFS read and write requests coming from uh, 2.x clients. So which, uh, in that case, actually, uh, if the client is already using web HDFS, so the EC data can be uh, well served, even though they didn't do the, they, they don't do that, don't, don't want to do the upgrade. So, but the problem is like uh, uh, only a small portion of the clients are using the web HDFS. Most of them are still using the Java native clients to do the read and write. So which means we can follow the similar this kind of pattern and architecture to design and implement a data access proxy to uh, translate the EC data and uh, serve uh, the read and write uh, read and write requests. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So in the end, uh, we actually develop a new uh, EC access proxy mainly to serve the read requests. So this proxy they actually sit inside of the data node team. Um, uh, process. So this is uh, quite similar just uh, with the web HDFS, this kind of architecture. So uh, the proxy is uh, launched inside the data node on a different port. Then this proxy on one side, it will just uh, receive the data transfer protocol requests from the old clients. And then in the meanwhile, the name node actually will have a capability to recognize all those kind of old clients and uh, provide the proxy port as the data locations. Um, on the other side of the proxy, the proxy will launch a uh, DFS client with Hadoop uh, to a 3.x version to read uh, the EC data. And then just a reconstruct it, uh, not, well, I would not say reconstruct, but say like um, uh, translate the data into the original replication uh, scheme and uh, serve the data back to the old clients. So in this way, actually all the old clients with uh, Hadoop 3.x version we can we will be able to read the data in a transparent way. They don't actually need to understand this is a, a Eurasia coding storage scheme. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, we actually only use the Eurasia coding for warm data. So the good part is for warm data, usually uh, the backfield traffic is small, although it's uh, still consistent. So which means we uh, have the, uh, possibility to serve the right traffic in a lazy way. way. So currently uh, our strategy is we allow the old kinds still write the replicated data into the EC directories. So since our name node has the capability to recognize all those old kinds, so actually uh, the name node will always enforce the replication storage scheme for all kinds that re uh, uh, for their write requests. Then afterwards, we have uh, we just uh, designed and uh, we develop uh, um, another offline tool to just uh, scan the EC directories to and uh, recognize all those kind of replicated data and do the offline conversion. So actually, this can well satisfy our requirements for the warm uh, tier uh, data sets. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So. Currently, uh, this is uh, the uh, the how how to say the overview of our Eurasia coding adoption work. So, um, I, uh, in the next step, so uh, we are planning to also uh, merge the hot and the warm clusters by adopting the unified uh, hardware skill. So, um, uh, one thing we are currently uh, working on is uh, to. Uh, within one uh, cluster, we are just uh, uh, adopting both the block tiering work, just uh, uh, introduced by Leon, and the original coding work, um, and uh, make them work together. So in this way, we actually finally can 
um, to make sure we just use uh, unified this kind of high density hardware and achieve uh, even better this storage cost. Yeah, next slide. Okay, yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much from our side. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think there are some questions uh, in the in the chat. I think Leon Leon already Leon already like uh, answered some. So Leon, probably you can just read us read the question, and uh, and also yeah, and also your answers as well. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Xing uh, uh, asked about like uh, yeah. First of all, the uh, desalinization is uh, we 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 have a multiple uh, metrics on the disk uh, IO utilization. So uh, mo mostly the uh, this IO utilization we mentioned in the presentation is uh, 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 is a percentage of time that uh, the uh, disk spindle is busy, uh, busy reading or writing. And uh, also we have uh, some other metrics like, uh, uh, for example, how many processes blocked by the uh, 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 blocked by the disk read. Uh, so those metrics are also pretty useful. And uh, for the tiering policy, we uh, have the uh, we, ha we we collect the audio log and the uh, name no LSR output. So uh, combine those together, we can have a, a, a hive table that we can query from. Uh, yeah. So we can define a, a policy based on that uh, based on the actual data. Uh, so yeah, actually one yeah one point on top of this. So normally, so right now we just choose three months. Anything more than three months is qualified for the data movement for warm tier. And for the code data, we, we use a lot of this like uh, name node, the audio log, name node audio log to determine which data is in the, is part of the code data. Yeah. Um, cool. So Leon, go ahead. Yeah, and probably Jin you wanna uh, uh, talk about the, oh, like the yeah. versioning? Oh uh, yeah, so still uh, most of our current uh, do casters, especially the hot casters, they are running 2.8. And uh, the customers are also uh, still using 2.8. So only the warm casters uh, using original coding is running 3.2. So that's why actually we developed this extra original coding access proxy for 2.x clients to read the original coding data. Okay. okay. Do we have any more questions? Okay. So if we don't have any questions, I think uh, that's that's all the end of our like talk. Okay. Thanks everyone for yeah, joining. Thank you, us. everyone. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.